I sure that I want to start the live event? I think you're sure. I'm sure I'm sure. <laughs> Come on, technology. Technolo technology is just hateful. It is just hateful. There. We're live in theory. Start the live again. <laughs> there we go. Theory is good. Hello. Can you see me? Can you see us? I can see us. Right on. I see some peoples. Hey, did you hear we're going to the moon? You're going to the moon. We're coming along for the ride. I, you know, I've heard this song and dance before. 1989 and 2004 is when you heard that you were going to the moon. That's but true. in 1989, 2010, you heard you were going to Mars. I'm going to believe, like spacecraft, it's dead to me until it happens. I know, I know, I know. Man, the the tone of the reporting of of this announcement was like just a bunch of crumb bum skeptics just kind of going oh come on we've heard this before and yet I every know. single person right you're like oh would you like to go to the moon would you like humanity to return to the moon and set foot on the moon and everybody would be like yes please yes yes that's what we want and so then the announcement is made like we're gonna go to the moon and you're like no you're not you're gonna like make some plans and then someone's gonna cancel your plans and it's the next presidential administration is just gonna say no and then they're gonna they're gonna say they're gonna go to mars and they're gonna go to the moon they're gonna go to mars and we're just gonna orbit the earth forever forever Never gonna I'm just going to maintain my span stance that, in general, spacecraft are dead to me until, until they're it, launched until, and working. Yep. <clears throat> Whether or not they have human beings on board. I still hold, and for the capabilities-driven approach, I think it's the way. All right. Uh, and then, of course, or we just, you know, go and vacation at the Elon Musk Mars Hotel in 2024 they're dead to me right. until they launch should we just watch a, a a compilation of rockets landing on spacex barges oh i love that video and the music <laughs> choice could not be better yes so so there is a youtube video out there we will we will have to find it and link it to all of you and it is a compilation of SpaceX failing to land, mm. failing to land, failing to land, landing. Yeah. And their choice of music is truly, so, truly awesome. It's a great video and it shows a ton of kind of referential humor and, you know, show, that's great. But if when the people start to die... Then... No, they they have to do this unmanned. Yeah, it's, right. NASA has the exact same stuff from before it was NASA and it was the Redstone days. There's mm -hmm. all all whole rockets. Series. Yeah, yeah, going up and falling down, back down and just toppling over and exploding, and then you've got Challenger and Columbia, and it just makes everything a little more, a lot more somber and meaningful. And you remember that there are human lives putting themselves on the line as you do these launches so so you're right i think now th this was the only time they could have done the hilarious oh uh, there we go uh this was it's the not the only time i fully expect them to blow up a falcon heavy that is like manned with cheese or something and you know that's just baked brie all right let me uh what and that's... you're no longer paying any attention to the feed Oh, what? What? What do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm putting the video up so people can see. Oh, okay. The compilation. Here we it go. It is a fabulous compilation. All right, I'll just place them here. Hard impact on the ocean. First soft water landing. Do it for the music on. Okay, let's see. I love the idea of a hard water landing because it makes total sense and makes absolutely no sense at the exact same time. Actually, you know, what? I'm not gonna put the music because then I'll get a copyright takedown. Not that I care. Elon Musk can have all the advertising for this episode. <laughs> oh, that's a dead rocket. 
All right, let's uh, let's focus on on this thing <laughs> that we're doing here. All right. I, yeah, that was the Monty Python music. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna say hi to some people. Okay. Oh. All right. Hello to Andrew, Arnold Post, Astro B, Brian Stab, Brooke Steele. That's like the coolest name, Brooke Steele. Uh, Coffee Singularity, Daniel Cool, DKTAZ00, Douglas Crandall, Dusty Reichwin, Galaxia, Giselle Sabarin, Gordon Dewis, Graham Walbridge, Guido Bibra, Holly Meyer, Janelle Duncan, John Victor, Johnny Zed, Quite a Libet, Quad Libet. Sorry, it's your. You're going to have to help me out. Lillian Brennan, Linda Sadek, Michael Jobin, uh, Nancy Graziano, Nicholas B., Peter Quinn, Arnstro, Renko Prozo, Renan C. Brazil, Richard Vila, Rick Schwartz, Susan Hunter, Susie, our producer, Murph, and Zapfan Zapfan. Hey, everybody. Hmm. Can you run it in a tiny window? I could <laughs> run it in a tiny window. Yes, I could. Um, but no, we have an episode of Astronomy Cast to do today. Maybe we'll we run do. it in a tiny window later on, uh, <laughs> or or just dig it up and you can and you can check it out. It's pretty awesome. Uh, whenever you're ready, I guess. As okay. always, if you're wondering what this is that you've stumbled into, uh, wow, well, you're a little a little scared today. A little, whoa. <laughs> Um, the volume, uh, the levels. You suddenly, it was the how do I get away pop, from pop, this pop. noise, but that doesn't work. With We're headphones. going to do an episode, a live episode of Astronomy Cast, episode 460, remote sensing, which I believe is something to do with psychics. So, yeah. hmm. um, so we're going <clears> to <throat> do an episode of Astronomy Cast, and then we'll stick around until the end of the hour and answer your questions about space and astronomy. You're probably going to want us to talk about SpaceX because we didn't get a chance to talk about it last week. We'll talk about the new moon plans and go from there. So I'm sure. Or whatever you want to talk about. Whatever. It's up to you. It's up to you. Let it begin. Okay. You ready? Yes. Okay. I am pressing re record. It is recording. I have also Hello, pressed record. Hello, Chad. Hello, Chad. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 460, Remote Sensing. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing really well. So, just a couple of things to mention before we get on with this week's episode number one uh patreon just to remember there is a patreon for astronomy cast and your support helps us make this show and there as you know there are sixty thousand people that listen to astronomy cast if each one of you gave a dollar a month a dollar a year it would totally pay for chad's time susie's time maybe our time which has never been paid for so it would be amazing if you could go to patreon.com slash astronomy cast in addition my regular job is universe today and we have a patreon for that and again we you know we do video editing we are trying to increase the production quality it's hard and expensive to make these things so if you can go to patreon.com slash universe today kick in man it would mean so much to me and the team so that's patreon.com slash astronomy cast or slash universe today or both. all of it helps us and out. Yeah, yeah if you can do both yeah. one dollar each that's yeah. all we want yeah that would be great uh now one before we get in image detectives give we're going to talk about it more in the episode yes. but can you yes. just give everyone because i you know i finally got to play around with it while we were doing the weekly space hangout and i was totally hooked and just like I was distracted enjoying uh, <laughs> playing around with the software. So where do people go to get involved in in Image Detectives? So this is our newest citizen science project. It invites you to help us label 1.5 million astronaut photos and determine what the heck the astronauts were taking pictures of. You can get to it by going to cosmoquest.org slash image detective. 
And I could see in last week's stats that a bunch of you during the recording of this episode did go to our website and did do science while we were talking. This is my challenge to outdo last week. And all of you, while you were listening, go to cosmoquest.org slash image detective and do science while you learn science. Right on. And actually, it's got a great guest feature where you can just kind of play around with it without having to totally sign up. So you can kind of get a sense of what the work is going to be like. And it is so much fun. So again, what Pamela just said, go there. The Space and, Age. And oh, go ahead. And I just have to say, this is one of those citizen science projects that has already proven to me that some of you are way better at accomplishing this task than I will ever be. So check out CosmoQuest's Twitch channel to watch me failing while getting help from the audience. Yep. So our Twitch channel is twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. The Space Age has given us the ability to look at every corner of the globe in every wavelength. It's revolutionized our ability to predict the weather, keep track of environmental damage, and watch the world change. Today, we look at what missions and technologies give us the ability to watch our world from afar. Now, remote sensing, the problem with the term remote sensing is it just makes me think of psychics. I know. Do we have I a know. better term than remote sensing? No. Earth observation. But but the problem is that remote sensing is is the term, the actual term for any time you take your sensor and you put it somewhere and you don't touch the thing you're observing. So when when we put a spacecraft in orbit around Mars and we are studying the surface of Mars, that's remote sensing. When we have LRO in orbit around the moon, that's remote sensing. Now, MAVEN, which is also in orbit of Mars, is, is only sometimes doing remote sensing because it actually has the ability to like open itself up and take samples. And that act of taking samples of directly sensing things, that, that's like normal sensing. So we have sensing with like mass spectrometers and things like that. And then we have remote sensing, which is where we're trying to understand a distant thing without touching it. Right. Which is also what psychics claim to do. But yeah, we're not see, talk about this that. is the problem. They I know, uh, I know. They stole our word. They stole they, the word. Yeah. Need it's kind of like skeptics got stolen yeah. by the climate people. Oh, all right. Fine. Our word. So we're just gonna it's we're, just, our we're just gonna reclaim it right now. So let's yes. so let's talk about it. Now you talked about sort of you know seeing things from afar. What was sort of the first usage when you can sort of think like what's the first time that we've ever been able to remote sense? I'm not gonna you know from space. I'm not gonna really think about stuff you know t you know setting up a camera here on Earth. But like what what sort of like an early kind of remote sensing instrument that we've had out there. Well, it, this is where you have to go back to the earliest days of, of spacecraft. And, and here we're starting to look back at 1947 when we were able to get pictures of Earth uh, from 100 miles up. So we weren't quite in orbit, but 100 miles up is still pretty darn good. So this is where we were using V2 rockets to launch cameras and look down instead of bombing what's below. I'm much happier taking the photos. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's <clears throat> putting Von Braun's weapons of war to, to a, a better use. So that's kind of really when the space age, we always talk about the space age starting with Sputnik. But, you know, once you cross that hundred kilometer height you're in space you get your astronaut wings every one of those v2 rockets got their astronaut wings before they exploded but um and that's when the space age really truly began and that's when we started to get this information from afar so this was the u.s vanguard program which had a combination of german scientists and american soldiers and scientists out in the desert of New Mexico, which is again where we're going with the uh, American spaceport that's now being built out there. And they were launching V-2 rockets and 
they put cameras on them and look down and we're still continuing to do this kind of ballistic trajectory with some of our instruments on what we call sounding rockets. So these are rockets that go into suborbit, which basically means they don't go all the way around the planet. And you can do all sorts of cool science by getting above the bulk of the atmosphere to look in wavelengths that normally you can't see because the atmosphere blocks them, or you can get high enough to get really cool views down on the earth. Uh, when did we start to like, I guess, really start to use this technology for staying on top of, of the environment of the earth, the weather, things like that? So there were a whole variety of, of different kinds of satellites doing different kinds of things. We had in 1960, the first television and infrared observation satellite, which was one of the first that allowed us to start monitoring our planet's weather. Uh, but we also had weird satellites that did things like try and confirm whether or not the nuclear test ban, not test ban treaty, but whether or not the Soviets were testing nuclear weapons. And these weren't imaging so much as they were looking for gamma rays, which is actually how the right. first gamma ray bursts yeah, got yeah. detected. So, so remote sensing sometimes senses in unintended directions. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> just... Can you just take a second? I mean, we did a whole episode on this, but that story is so interesting about that, about those first spacecraft. Can you just mint, just go into a little more detail about that story? So, so, well, back in the 1960s, the, the Vela satellites were designed to look for nuclear tests. Our concern was that the Soviet Union would break the international treaty saying thou shalt not test nuclear weapons. We, we are done blowing up atolls and deserts and things like that. And because they're kind of on the other side of the planet, the way we were going to monitor whether or not they adhered to these treaties was we were going to look for the effects in the form of gamma ray radiation that would be given off by a nuclear test uh, with, with orbiting satellites, thus the Vela satellites that were capable of detecting gamma rays. Now, the thing about gamma rays is they're super hard to focus, to detect. So you basically throw out a detector and it's going to detect gamma rays coming from all sides and sometimes like through the planet and things like that. It's, it's, well, it's more neutrinos that go through yeah, the planet, but they're the going to, yeah. the gamma rays go through the spacecraft. And so these early detectors didn't have directional orientation, you might say. So we started detecting gamma rays we started realizing that they weren't coming from terrestrial sources. And after we got angry at the Soviets and then realized we shouldn't have, we realized the universe was doing something weird. But there was that intermediate step of getting angry at the Soviets and trying to figure out what was going on. Right. And this, instead of leading to war or other bad things, ended up leading to an entirely new field of astronomy. And now we know that gamma ray bursts are associated with things like gravitational waves, with supernovae, with neutron stars, with magnetars that are reorganizing their surfaces. Uh, there's all, not their surfaces, their magnetic fields. There's all sorts of amazing things out there, mostly far, sometimes near, that are generating these high energy wavelengths of light and we know this because we were trying to remotely sense these Soviets testing nuclear weapons above the surface of the planet. Now, one of the most successful series that I sort of think about are the Landsats. And I remember yes. seeing Landsat images, even when I was a kid, you would see Landsat, these amazing photographs of the Earth from space, but they were sort of had interesting colors. And those were one of the most successful and there's still Landsats going up, new missions going up, you know, every couple of years. 
Right. So so we have a whole variety of different series of spacecraft that get used by a variety of different space agencies and um, science agencies to monitor our changing planet. And the Landsat satellites are, I think, probably the most well-known of all of these. Uh, so the, the name Landsat first came about in 1975, but the program uh, started in 1966. And the, the work was really pushed forward in the late 70s by Jimmy Carter. So, so it was through the ecological movement of the 60s and 70s that uh, NASA and the National uh, Atmospheric Administration, I think it's administration, let me double check that, Sorry, Chad, you're going to have to edit this. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Chad. So it, it was a combined effort of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This is NOAA and NASA working together that was involved in, in getting these images. And they, they have this beautiful full color imagery, which you were referring to. And it's used to uh, monitor river flooding, to monitor changes in forest, to look at with combined wavelengths what happens when these forest fires tear through Canada and the American West. Uh, the first of this series was launched in 1972 and like you said, these are still going today. We're currently up to using Landsat 8. It was launched back in 2013. And, and we're kind of hoping that in 2020, we'll be able to launch, uh, well, Landsat 9. So these are, are fairly long-lived spacecraft. Not all of them have, have survived. Uh, Landsat 6 didn't exactly make it to space. Uh, but what is really great about this series is they build on that same tradition that we saw with Cassini of taking a past spacecraft model, tweaking it a little bit, Cassini built on the Mariner series. And with the Landsat series, it's its, its own series of spacecraft. And each of these is either identical to the predecessor or just an incremental update. Spacecraft wear out, they break down, but the technology is rock solid. So we just keep updating a little but keeping the core design to keep the costs down and the science coming yeah and it's it's such a great way i mean we think about some of the ways that we explore other worlds mars things like that to just have this platform that just gets used again and again and again but they put a better ccd array a better camera on it better faster communication things like that and the thing that's great about a lot of these devices as you said, they're looking in wavelengths that the human being can't see and different wavelengths reveal different kinds of things here on Earth and, and on other worlds. So can you talk a bit about sort of what kinds of other wavelengths are useful for, for different kinds of observations that you're trying to make? So uh, right now, one of the wavelengths that's getting used a lot to monitor the Angong, and I'm probably destroying the pronunciation of that, uh, volcano down in Bali, which is probably going to erupt shortly. Yes, this is me being yeah. excited about death and destruction. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're monitoring this volcano in the infrared so they can see the places in the volcanic crater that are heating up, emitting steam. They can see the flanks of the volcano. And, and so here, by looking in wavelengths that our eyes can't see, we're, we're able to systematically see that this volcano is hopefully going to do something really cool shortly. Uh, then, so beyond just using plain old infrared, uh, we, we also sometimes do neat and interesting things where instead of looking in a straight uh, color of light, we do things like uh, we look for neutrons. So we look for scattered neutrons coming off of the moon, for instance, because that is indicative of there being water beneath the surface. So when we do remote sensing, we are studying things in colors of light. So we use infrared, we use, inf uh, we use ultraviolet, we use plain old 
eyeball colors, the visible colors of light. Uh, we also reflect radar off right. of things. And that's what I was going to sort of bring up next is uh, there's a sort of a famous Canadian uh, mission called RadarSat. Um, but and, and we talked a bit about this with Cassini, how it had a ground penetrating radar. We talked about this with Arecibo. Radar lets you see some things that you just wouldn't normally be able to see in any other way. So let's talk about that. So, so with radar, what you're doing is you're sending out a pulse of light in the same color as the radio that you detect with the radio in your car. Uh, I just used a wavelength name to define the wavelength. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, so, so with radar, you're sending out a pulse of radio light, and then you're detecting how long it takes to come back. And you do this in a geometric sweep if if you're uh, trying to measure something out or you move the thing that's emitting the radar which is what they do with the spacecraft so as your spacecraft goes along it emits a pulse of radio and then you measure how long it takes for that pulse to come back if it comes back faster something is closer that's doing the reflecting it takes longer to come back the thing that it's reflecting off of is further away and nowadays we're we're doing this this radar technology in more than just radar and this is where we start to get into lidar which is laser uh versions of radar so the shorter the wavelength of light that you use to do the reflecting the smaller you're able to measure things and so as we get to visible colors of light that we're reflecting uh which we're not quite there yet. But as we get towards that, we're able to measure smaller and smaller differences. So the key is send a pulse of light, count how long it takes to come back, and that tells you how far away something is. Another great technology is a um, some kind of spectrometer so that you can actually determine the chemical constituents of something. How do, how do those work? So in this case, uh, it's not as much uh, if you're doing mass spectroscopy. That again is that's hands not on. remote that's sensing. Regular sensing. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if you're doing light spectroscopy, this is where you're looking at the colors of light that, in general, are reflected off of something. In the case of remote spectroscopy, so uh, or remote sensing rather. So sunlight reflects off the moon you measure the spectrum of light that's reflected. Some colors are going to be absorbed by that surface. Some are going to be emitted by the surface. Sometimes the light that hits the surface is absorbed, re-emitted as a different color. And by measuring these colors, you're able to get hints of what's in the surface, what's doing this absorbing, and you're able to get at the temperature of that surface by looking at the overall black body distribution of how it's re-radiating light. That is really cool. There was a sort of interesting mission planned. We talked about this in the weekly space hangout about <clears throat> that they could send 50 separate little five kilogram satellites to observe 300 different asteroids. They'd be equipped with a tiny little set of binoculars sized lens and a you know some kind of uh you know spectrometer and so they could just know what the chemical composition of each one of these asteroids was at a, at a reasonably high level of of resolution but this is the kind of thing i know like curiosity has the ability to just look around with its eyes and see the chemical makeup of the rocks around it it can and it can even shoot a laser and <laughs> that this is this strange mix of do you call this uh, remote sensing or local sensing with curiosity because you're imaging it instead of touching it but curiosity has the ability to go zoop and touch something and grind away on it which yes. is kind of rude but it has that capacity well but it can see it can see with its uh, eyes um mm -hmm the landscape around it and map out the chemical constituents of it. I think it does it with ultraviolet anyway. And then, as you said, it can go right up and then grind on some interesting piece of mineral, but it's a really handy way to sort of quickly look at the whole landscape, find what you want and then move close. I think, you know, when I think about 
what's happening now here on Earth, there are so many amazing missions and satellites, both from the uh, from NASA and the Europeans. I'm sure there's a bunch from the Chinese and the Russians that we don't know about, but and I'm sure there's a bunch from NASA or the you know the the U.S. Uh, military that we don't know about. But you know, Terra, Aqua. There's all these satellites that are mapping out the ground and mapping out ice flows and mapping out river systems and water systems and everything like and weather discover. systems discover yeah which i which is the one i always point to whenever someone was like you know some flat earth is like wow well, there's no there's no how come there's no live picture of the earth and i'm like okay just look just go check out the discover pictures those should be what you're looking for and and it has the best named instrument i i really want to meet the person who came up with this acronym and like shake their hand and buy them a coffee because EPIC stands for Earth Polychromatic, which is a fancy way of saying multicolor imaging camera. And just the fact that they like came up with the word polychromatic so that it would be EPIC is EPIC. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so what does the future hold for remote sensing? What are some ideas of missions? I mean, is any of this coming up on the decadal survey, do you think? What are some sort of big ideas, missions, capabilities for the future of, of remote sensing? It's, it's hard to know exactly what will come out of the decadal survey process, which is something that's probably about to start spinning up this year. I, we know that we don't have the full suite of weather satellites that we really need to get very accurate, uh, far out forecasts and that a lot of our weather satellites are getting kind of old and need replaced. So what we're looking at is a future where we need a suite of sun, sun synchronous satellites. These are orbiting imagers that always have the same sun earth angle beneath them and sweep across the entire planet. I, we need to have our full suite of geostationary satellites that are always sitting there looking down. And right now we're augmenting all of this also by well, as we brought up at the top of the show, asking the astronauts to uh, hang their head in a window, not out a window, you don't do that on the space station, and look down at the Earth and just grab handheld photos of our planet if they happen to be what's straight above what we're most interested in. It would be awesome if we could have more spacecraft up there so that we had better uh, time coverage from different angles. And it's that time coverage that at the northern and southern latitudes is most difficult because the geosynchronous satellites just can't get a good view on the top of the world. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's pretty amazing the resolution of the of even the stuff that's in Google Maps. I mean, some of it's aerial, some of it's space based, but these new even private missions that are going up and mapping the earth at at higher and higher resolutions. I forget what we're down to a couple of meters in in resolution now a meter meter and a half smaller than that even. Yeah, yeah I have to admit I'm not sure and and they do just to reinforce this Google Maps is largely aerial photography. It's largely aerial photography, but there's a new missions uh, digital globe, I think yes. and even Google bought and terror these, server yeah and google bought one of these these companies and so because there's so many um like commercial private uses for this kind of data for surveying for agriculture use for uh you know for city planning things like that there's a pretty busy industry of putting these satellites up and selling the imagery to various services so you know, we're not quite at the point where, you know, it's like that Simpsons episode where, where the it's in, it's in real time and Homer, you know, is looks up and sees the satellite looking down at him, you know, but we're, we're getting close. And, and there's a lot of real need for this. Uh, for instance, right after the Puerto Rico disaster with Hurricane Maria, a lot of people were frantically trying to get imagery to look down on places that we haven't been able to get cars into yet. A lot of the interior of Puerto Rico is still 
basically cut off because the roads have been destroyed. And again, with with all of the disasters going on around the world, if if we can have a spacecraft getting a safe view in, it it helps us figure out where to direct the helicopters. So having that view really helps and having that view beforehand helps us better figure out exactly where storms are going. We're currently several days out on the newly formed tropical storm Nate out in, uh, well, out south of the Gulf of Mexico. And we're already starting to be able to see that people need to be battering their hatches on the Gulf and there's a chance of a direct hit on New Orleans. Being able to prep ahead of time is the reason that lives haven't been lost in the numbers they might have been with Irma and Maria and all of the, the terrible weather that we've had this year. Yeah. Yep. I'm more and more worried about what's going on in Puerto Rico and and – Uh, I'm horrified. Yeah, yeah. And I really, really hope that they can get back to some kind of power. Without power, you get chaos and and people's lives. So so this is a time when remote sensing is more important than ever to know exactly where. I mean, have you seen the pictures of Puerto Rico at night? And that it's just dark. It's dark. Compared to what it was, you know, back when it had full power. That is a great indication to show you where people are in trouble. In addition, as you said, you know, the aerial photography, the the satellite photography, and using some of these other wavelengths to see things like vegetation damage, flood zones. We're going to need this technology for these kinds of disasters more than we ever have. And, and in the past, we've used remote sensing of scattering light off of foliage to do things like look for pot crops hidden in the forest. <laughs> this is like legit a thing that we've used remote sensing for as a species. Uh, now, instead, what we can start to do is, is look to see where has the foliage been completely destroyed, what is left, and because of our insistence of trying to find marijuana crops, we actually have a good understanding of how different kinds of foliage and plants reflect light. Um, It's amazing what we can do. And it's, it's now proving that we need to be able to do this for law enforcement, for civil protection, and just for humanitarian reasons of finding that person that is out there still needing help. Thanks, Pamela. We'll talk to you next week. Sounds good, Fraser. All right. Save. Wow, we ended that on a downer. I know. Wow, we ended that on a downer. How do we make this? Oh, well, I can't. We just end. We We just just end. Sometimes I just end. Yep. Uh, Episode 460. Thank you. I, I, so I just had an idea. This may break you. Um... (laughs) But, okay. But you know how my brain works. I do. Could I do. there be, could CosmoQuest somehow work with whoever's bringing, you know, whatever new footage is coming out to do, to assist with disaster relief by analyzing photographs of Puerto yeah. Rico? Right? Yeah, we would just need to be able to get the photos. We we have everything in place. Yeah, so like couldn't couldn't we serve up the imagery to the people in the community to identify, you know, there's no power here. There's, um, you know, whatever, I, I, you know, houses are torn down here. Roads seem to be inaccessible there. Like, I'm not sure what, you know, if someone could get the imagery, could a community like Cosmos with the platform that we have be able to? Yes. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. We totally have the technology to do that. Hmm. I wonder how we Perhaps could do that. Perhaps talk to the folks at Hero X, see if if they have a way to get the data. Yeah, who would have that? So who'd have that data? It would be it would be satellite and, but you'd really want the the aerial data, right? Yeah. But, so so ideally, new. you'd want to send someone uh, hmm. in with a airplane or helicopter to do video, um, and then have people or. Uh, 
do an intervalometer and just look through the photos uh, using the inter that were taken with the intervalometer. Yeah. But huh. yeah, you'd need to do constant data updates, but it's the kind of thing that we have the capacity to handle. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking, just to be able to look through this stuff and, and identify, you know. Yeah, our image they... detective software package would completely handle that. We just change out what are the words underneath the image. Yeah. And um, hmm. yeah. Okay. And we could use Google Maps to figure out exact addresses of places yeah. if, if, if yeah. there's a minimal amount of destruction of people are mentioning items. other places the virgin islands t totally yeah. yeah all these places right i mean just any place mexico city yeah yeah i mean any place that gets hit by just to be able to do some kind of assessment by a large group of human beings to quickly provide um uh, information there's there's got to be a way that we can pitch in and provide information to various first responders because we've got the the photo infrastructure we've got the people and and we have the software yeah we just need yeah, the images yeah we just need the images but the images are i mean you know i'm sure someone out there is taking the images so i don't know who we would talk to someone at nasa i guess to get the data and then it's not a nasa person Noah? It, it because they they aren't doing well they aren't doing ground-based they're doing space-based and so what we really need is is a private individual because right now that's who's doing all of the help. Hmm. Um, the, the strangest and most awesome news story I saw this week, um, it wasn't by itself the strangest. It was by itself the greatest combination of strange and awesome. One of the women who does the Real Housewives of, I don't remember which city, uh, went into Puerto Rico with five privately chartered airplanes of supplies and uh, emergency medical technicians to go in and use her own resources uh, to do damage relief. So far, there's been less than $30 million authorized for Puerto Rico. That's nothing. Yeah. That is, that is absolutely nothing. So it's it's going to be private individuals. Yeah, FEMA doesn't have the resources. I wonder if, because I know that like SpaceX, for example, is, or Tesla is sending in a bunch of power plants and solar cells, and they're going to try and provide emergency power and maybe even help them return to a, um, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, but have it go solar like like what's happening on Kauai and there's a there's an island in the South Pacific that they've switched over to solar power. That would have saved them, right? To have a solar completely decentralized solar grid with battery power, that would have changed everything. But but that isn't yeah. sort of in the cards. So, you know, and in fact, man, I, I, that is the solution to, you know, if Elon Musk needs another existential crisis, the... Um, the Carrington event, right? You know, you get a planet-wide yeah. solar storm of that kind of magnitude, and all we're all Puerto Rico then, right? One and, half and of the one planet of the things, is is wiped off the grid. So, and one of the things that I've I've been amazed to watch, and also thinking about doing myself, is it was realized through all of these different events that the only way left to communicate is a uh, ham radio. And so I'm watching uh, Dr. Matthew Francis get his ham radio off uh, his ham radio license. We were getting information from Nobel laureate Joe Taylor, who did his research in Puerto Rico using Arecibo and also as a ham radio guy and has been communicating and and i can say that arecibo is up and running on generators they are actually running the dish showing that they can get data um but they're doing it off generators everyone is doing pretty much everything off yeah. generators and i've been following the feeds of some of the scientists and i saw a tweet yesterday that that broke my heart it it was i found food oh. and they had ice and and when someone is tweeting with exclamation marks because they got a cold drink yeah 
And this is this is part of the United States of America. Yeah. Yeah. They're American citizens, right? Yeah. Um, OK, so let's let's I don't see a lot of questions. Um, That's because we broke everyone's heart. I know. I know. Um, Please go do image detective. It's uplifting. Uh, Gordon is you can't asking see any of these health the, things in it. What are the upper limits for optical from orbit? So how capable i don't know yeah you know what okay i'm just gonna find i'm not sure any of us know well but the problem is we don't know what the top secret spycraft are doing well of course yeah <laughs> yes he's like i'm going to ignore those and look up the number for everything else whereas i'm like well, i can't find out because it's top secret the oh, the the most chilling idea the most chilling sort of story that i always go back to is the fact that the U.S. military recently gave NASA two s telescopes that were not good enough for them as Hubble-class yes. space telescopes. Yes. And they were just w like, first is good. here's some old crap we've got kicking around. Why don't you use them? And NASA's like, these are really good telescopes. That is terrifying, right? So you know that there are some amazing Earth observation satellites right now. Uh, Sylvan Westby saying right now in the chat, to 20 to 30 centimeters per pixel. So, you know, like, okay. a, like a foot per pixel is sort of where the limits are. And that's how you can see uh, sunbathers, you know, but you can't necessarily see, um, you know, anything beyond that. Although a lot of that, again, is still aerial imagery. And we both uh, bore everyone in the audience yeah. John, while we look at things online. John Drake is asking, how about an astronomy cast series from the point of view of other nations, sp space programs, the Chinese space program, Japan, et cetera? We did a bunch of those. We we did, and maybe it's time to, to update. Redo them. Yeah, but yeah. the problem is there's not a lot of really good information coming out of a lot of those countries in English. So... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would love to be able to, you know, like the Chinese space program, for example, is largely secretive that we don't know what their plans are until they do a thing. So so we find out, oh, they just launched a space station. Oh, they just landed a rover on the moon. Oh, they just la launched a spacecraft that went beyond the moon. So we could definitely talk about, you know, some of those spacecraft missions, things like that. Uh, the Indian program is a lot, you know, a lot more information that's happening with the Indian yeah. program. You know, there's the mom spacecraft, there's their new rocket launch system. So that's fascinating. Um, but, but yeah, it would just, I guess it would just take more research. Like, a, they, you know, so that's all. We just need to set aside some time to do more research to be able to do the, the episode. That's the kind of thing that you would want to watch on the Guide to Space I think because yes. I yes. can sit down and do the research and take the time and, you know, it doesn't have to sort of come out of Pamela's head and just think about how she's going to mispronounce a lot of the words anyway. It's true. This, By, is, this oh. isn't meant to be my shtick, but it accidentally yeah. and much to my horror and dismay is my shtick. So a, apologizing. When you have hatches, by the way, you don't batter them. You batten them. No. Just wanted to let you know. Batten down Have the I hatches. Have I been saying that wrong? Yeah, you just okay. you, you took it for granted. That that you, you have you have to be watching Rick and Morty to get that joke. I hope someone in the chat got the joke. No, I'm, I totally got that. Because I'm really clever. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just make dad jokes. I do just make dad jokes. We we did an episode where I of the guy to space and I wrote like part of the script and Jay, my collaborator on it, was took my took the script that I had written and was like, My name is Fraser Kane and I am no longer allowed to make stupid dad jokes and <laughs> and made me say and how that. How well did that go yeah, over? And ma and made me say that in the episode. It was hilarious. So But did you obey? Yeah. No, no, of course not. No. <laughs> 
now. And now Jay is too busy to work with me. So I'm like literally completely free to make as many dad jokes as I need to. There you go. Quadly bit got it. Maury's mind blowers. Oh yeah. Uh, the Chinese Adam Synergy says the Chinese uh, Chang E3 website is completely unfathomable. Yeah, that man, it is tough. There is. <laughs> Sorry, Gordon just said you batter chick chicken fingers. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, the, a lot of these Chinese websites, I we're just not there yet. I, I can't. My Chinese, the translation is not is not there, and the there's so much propaganda, right? So anything that the, that the Russians say, anything that the Chinese say, anything that the Americans say, you you just have to uh, take it all with a grain of salt. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a tough it's a tough one. Um, a really big grain of salt. Yeah. Uh, Arjun wants to know, how is remote sensing for exoplanets going to improve in the next decade? Could we do remote sensing for Planet 9 if it exists? Yeah. We just need money. That's that's our biggest issue is money. <laughs> yeah. Well, we need Please better telescopes. The, uh, you know, I got a chance to talk to Mike Brown, uh, you know, the Pluto, the Pluto killer and He's the guy. the nicest guy. And he... Uh, he was talking about how he discovered all of those Kuiper Belt objects. He and his team discovered all those Kuiper Belt objects when that next class of big telescopes was built down in Chile. And pretty much they hit the limit of what's possible to sense in roughly the, the plane of the ecliptic. I mean, there could be other objects that are in stranger orbits, but that was, that was the one that, that they were able to, to, to find out. And he said, when the next, you know, when the next round of telescopes come out, that's when we're going to find that all of the next round of objects. So when uh, James Webb goes up, when the um, LSST go comes online, when the 30 meter telescope, when the, uh, you know, all these big telescopes go up, you're going to hear a flurry of new discoveries of, of all these Kuiper Belt objects and hopefully Planet Nine as well. Uh, which which might, according to the rumors, have been found recently. We're all eagerly waiting to see a publication come out. I there, love rumors. Oh, really? I hadn't heard those rumors. There was a bunch. There was an article just came out, I think, from NASA, but they sort of put together all of the evidence so far, and it was like there was now four separate pieces of evidence that, that indicate that this Planet Nine is out there. Yeah, uh, it's just finding its orbit and measuring its mass and other properties yeah. that yeah astro b is wanting us to talk about the parker solar probe uh, remember pamela's rule she doesn't talk about them uh until they are successfully launched so wait is the parker solar probe launched i did a whole episode on the parker solar probe and it's really because cool. he'll talk about anything yeah um no, not launched yet. So so I've had spacecraft blow up on me that I needed and wanted and liked. And, and so it's just easier not to get emotionally attached or put that information into my brain. Yeah. Uh, did you see, so Larry Beckham is saying that the 30 meter is a go for Hawaii. My emotions are mixed. Yeah, I'm having the same thing. I Canary Islands really, truly wanted it. So I'm... I'm saddened that they didn't move the place to the Canary Islands. Yeah. It it seems like needlessly causing harm. I mean, I don't know sort of what happened, but did the um did the Hawaiians just kind of cave? To... No, the, the it was a court, and the mm. judge determined that they could move forward, and that's that's where I'm like, it should just move because yeah. the people who own the land don't want it. Yeah, and the and Canary the Islands really want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's not cool, man. No. Yeah, I would say. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, the Canary Islands are fine. Canary Islands are, are great. The biggest telescope in the world is in the Canary Islands right now. 
So the Grand Canary it Telescope, 11.6 meters. Grand Canaria. Okay. Grand, yeah. Okay. Not actually the biggest telescope in the world is the one that's at McDonald Observatory. It's the uh, the large binocular telescope. Hobby Eberly Telescope. The binocular, the large. I think it's no, there. that's not at McDonald's. No, it's large in binocular. I think. Yeah, yeah which yeah. is not McDonald. Yeah, and of course, if you add up these four separate telescopes from the very large array. The, yeah. No, the. Very large telescope. Very large telescope, the VLT. VLT then that act because they can act like one single telescope. So. That's the biggest telescope, but um, that that's the one I was thinking of. And us, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, it's, there's it's four big. separate eight meter telescopes that mm -hmm. act like one telescope. But the and it, then they also have a bunch of little one meter satellite telescopes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, Canary Islands are fine. It's it's near Europe. It's got dark skies. It's you know Does it's it above matter now. It's above the weather. Well, the other stuff's going to go to the Canary Islands. So yeah, yeah. But it is nice having a northern – that's the key is it's nice to have a northern hemisphere because the Atacama Desert in Chile is so great for putting telescopes. It's like this black hole that is sucking in all of the telescope plans because it's just so great. Arjun wants to know when we're going to get the Event Horizon picture. Soon. I don't know. October is was the original plan i love this we we were expected to get it in october because the uh because we had to wait for the data to get there from antarctica and they had to wait for the weather to get better in antarctica so that they could fly yeah. the the uh the data out so october but i'm sure by the time we actually see that picture it's going to be another couple of months so Uh, George or Jorge Schauen, this conversation has made me realize I don't know any telescopes in mainland Europe. There's a ton of big observatories in mainland Europe, but not yeah. of that same scale. Uh, the they're meterish class, and yeah, there's a good uh, one often in, working in other wavelengths. Spain and Italy, Romania has a good one. The Budapest Observatory, there's the the Vatican has a big observatory. Uh, the yeah. bigger one is is in Arizona. The the I'm trying to remember if it's Spain or Italy that you take the ski lift with the skiers yeah, yeah, up yeah, to yeah, the yeah. top. Yeah, that's right. And there's an observer. There's one and, and so you see these these observers with their suitcases yeah. and briefcases and computer bags, yeah. looking very stupid among the skiers. And there's one in Greece. Uh, so there's a bunch in across Europe, but not the same. It's like it's the next level down. Like in the United States, there are dozens of like two meter, one meter, two meter class telescopes. Lots and lots and lots of them, but there are there's only a few of the big ones, the eight meter plus, and they're all in the darkest, clearest, most remote skies. The best place for a telescope is actually the high plains of Antarctica. It's just really hard to get to. And you can only see darkness half the year and lightness half yeah. the year, so yeah. that's a bit troubling. All right, we've reached the end of the hour. Let's wrap things up. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. As always, that is the chat. Go to wshcrew.space if you want to join the live chat. Don't forget to go to patreon.com slash astronomycast and slash universe today to contribute to the projects that we work on so we can bring more content all the time. Even a dollar a month makes a gigantic difference. So we really appreciate it. And finally... CosmicQuest.org slash image detectives. Detective. Yes. Image Go detective. do science. You should make image, image detective. detective. Make image detective. I'm going to make both work. As well. I'm yeah. going to go do that right now. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, for watching. See you all next week. Bye bye.